The fight over sex ed is back at the Capitol with the same screwy arguments about stuff that's not actually in the bill, while one legislator makes a shocking claim about consent. The president declaring a national emergency over the border wall has a Colorado center on the fence. Watch out, it's sharp. The world's most famous prison escape artist is headed to our state's inescapable prison, or so we think. The Broncos spiked the football on the business owner who took them on and lost, and it's your good news that ends our week. Next. Republicans at the state capitol tried to abstain from a sex ed bill's passage, but the anatomy of the legislature does not require their consent. They didn't have the votes to stop the bill, which requires any school that chooses to teach sex ed also mention same-sex relationships and the idea of consent. Republicans were able to delay it with dozens of doomed amendments, and one legislator made a truly shocking comment. Our Marshall Zellinger explains. The uh, motion fails. No! The no's have it. L61 is lost. All those opposed now? No! L029 fails. That sums up the hours long sex ed bill debate in the Colorado State House. The same bill that filled a committee room till midnight late last month and got a normally soft spoken sergeant in arms to be not so soft spoken. Listen and move this way or this way. At the committee hearing, some people who testified used graphic language, believing this sex ed bill would have teachers describing explicit sex acts to students. Can anyone point out to where it says that it's required that we're teaching explicit sex techniques? because I'm not seeing it anywhere in the bill. I checked again. It doesn't. It also doesn't do what a constituent emailed Republican Representative Steve Humphrey. House Bill 19-1032 requires schools that provide comprehensive sex education to teach pro-LGBTQ sex education while banning the teaching of religious or values-based sex education. Humphrey didn't say if he emailed the constituent back accurate information, but here it is. Conversation about lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities has been part of comprehensive sex education in Colorado since this 2013 bill was signed by then-Governor John Hickenlooper. If a school is not including LGBT students, and health information, then they are out of compliance with current law. The bill also doesn't ban religious-based sex education. Nothing shall be interpreted to prohibit discussion of religious values. But sex ed classes would not be allowed to endorse religious ideology. Something new in the bill. Comprehensive sex education would require a discussion on consent and defining what consent means. That nugget is one reason Republican Representative Perry Buck does not like this bill. You cannot do a one-size-fits-all. My district, the unincorporated, God bless them all, don't want to be told what they think is consent, what they think is their curriculum. Everybody has different degrees. No. The definition of consent does not change when you cross county lines. If there were ever an argument for explicitly teaching consent to students in sex education, what you just heard would be the reason. If you're from Bucks District in Weld County, if you're from Montrose, if you're from Denver, if you're from Tampa, Chicago, New York, I don't care. The definition of consent is not different. She actually, she actually said that the people in her district don't want to be told what consent means. Okay, so, so everybody's on the same page on this, Marshall. Let's read the, the definition of consent under Colorado law, which okay. Representative Buck's husband, a prosecutor, put people away for violating. Consent means cooperation and act or attitude pursuant to exercise of free will and with knowledge of the nature of the act, the current or previous relationship shall not be sufficient to constitute consent. Submission under the influence of fear does not constitute consent. It's in the law. And it's in the law no matter what area you live in. That's mind boggling and that is dangerous. I'm just gonna say it. All right, Marshall, thank you. Colorado senators are split on President Trump's decision to declare a national emergency to build a border wall. You got Democratic Senator Michael Bennett, who's opposed, and you got Republican Senator Cory Gardner, who is on the fence, which seems like that could be pretty painful because based on the diagram that President Trump himself tweeted out, the border fence with its steel slats has these sharp little pointy tops on it. Senator Gardner might not want to be on that fence for long. Only yesterday, though, Senator Gardner was saying that he did not support declaring a national emergency to build the border wall. Listen to what he told KOA Radio. Yeah, I think uh, declaring a national emergency is not the, the right idea. I think uh, Congress needs to do its job. So while Senator Gardner positions himself upon his precarious and pokey perch on the fence, 
Colorado's Democratic Attorney General is trying to make liberal hearts flutter by saying that he might sue the president. But trust me, ease those liberal hearts. Phil Weiser, he's going to be stuck in the friend zone, as in the friend of the court brief zone. He is not going to be one of the Democrats out front leading the charge against President Trump. And let me explain why. Colorado is in the 10th Circuit. It's a more conservative court. Democrats surely want their challenge to this national emergency declaration to go through a really liberal court, like the 9th Circuit out of California. So our Attorney General, uh, Mr. Weiser, he may write a strongly worded letter on this, but even President Trump knows where the real threat to his plan lies. They will sue us in the 9th Circuit, uh, even though it shouldn't be there. And we will possibly get a bad ruling, and then we'll get another bad ruling, and then we'll end up in the Supreme Court, and hopefully we'll get a fair shake. If Attorney General Weiser escapes the friend zone, or if Senator Gardner gets off the fence, we will let you know. The world's most infamous drug lord is likely to spend the rest of his life two hours south of Denver in the Supermax prison in Florence. El Chapo escaped from prison twice in Mexico. Could he do it here? Our Katie Eastman looks back to the one time our cameras were allowed inside. Before 9-11, before the Oklahoma City bombing, before the bombs at the Marathon, a prison was built for the people who would later commit those crimes. What do you think about this new federal prison coming? Prisoners don't bother us. They're not going to get out. Since the administrative maximum facility, known as the ADX, opened, no one has escaped. But Joaquin El Chapo Guzman has escaped not one, but two prisons in Mexico. As soon as I was in there, the, you know, the hair on my arms was standing up. Nine News psychology expert Dr. Max Wachtel was in the Supermax prison a couple years ago to evaluate an inmate. Um, you know, they're very isolated. They, um, most of them can't even see out into the hallway from their cell. It would, it would take an infiltration of the, the, the prison staff to get out. Back in 1994, the prison said inmates leaving their cell would still be shackled and accompanied by two guards. The only way I'm going to get out is to back up into the cuff slot, put my hands through, palms out, thumbs up, that I would be cuffed from behind. It's hard to know if the prison still looks the same. A court order bars Dr. Max from telling us specific security details. But he knows one thing for sure. If El Chapo ends up here. It seems like the, the only place that would be able to house him. It will be for good. They've got terrorists in there. They have you know, one of the 9-11 masterminds in there. They know how to deal with this. He's not going to get out. For next, I'm Katie Eastman. El Chapo will be officially sentenced in June, and it's only at that point where we'll know for sure where he will be sent to serve life. We've been missing our friend Anusha Roy on this program this week. She's filling in on the morning show these days because Corey Rose had her baby. She had a beautiful, happy baby boy. So for the next few months, you'll be seeing Anusha occasionally on Next. Tonight, she returns to tackle one of your questions about a topic that she's been covering extensively, hemp. Our next question comes from Keith, who says states are now legalizing marijuana despite the fact that it's still classified illegal by the federal government. Well, doesn't that imply that states can still classify hemp as illegal, even though the federal government classified it as legal? Hey, Keith, so you are definitely on to something. We actually talked to a local hemp lawyer about this. Now, since the federal government has legalized hemp, it's essentially setting a standardized rule for the country. David Wunderlich said states can come up with even stronger rules if they want, including criminal law, and defining something as a controlled substance that is not controlled by the federal government. Those rules just can't be more relaxed than the federal ones. So essentially, it's kind of opposite from what we've seen with marijuana, where states like Colorado moved ahead with legalizing pot, knowing very well it is illegal under federal law and the federal government could come in and prosecute people. These kinds of issues, though, can get sorted out in court. All right, somebody else needs a reminder. That's not how you Colorado, specifically the jabronis who rode, rode motorcycles on muddy ground at the Picture Rock Trail in Boulder County open space. Trails were closed at the time, closed for a reason, and the motorcycles did quite a bit of damage. Those people were found and they were fined $450 a piece. But Rangers noticed that some other people had been out on those closed trails. So please, please, please check conditions online before you go. How about the story of a trailblazer we can admire? 
This woman did it in a couple of ways. She made me feel that I was valued. A few Denver Broncos have something to say about that sporting goods store that closed because of its politics. And your good news, finally Friday after a busy week. Let's hear yours next. Ah, beautiful Friday. Cool, calm, and quiet. We're in between storm systems and our high. How about the high today? Almost 60 in the city. We'll be cooler, windy tomorrow with mountain snow ramping up around midnight tonight. Winter weather and travel advisories have gone out for what could be a period of heavy snow from midnight through noon tomorrow. We get a break along the front range until Sunday. Sunday into Monday is when Denver will see colder, windy weather and the chance for one to three inches of snow. Tonight, decent travel, I-25 and I-70 until the wee hours of the morning. Then the snow really ramps up and it'll be a factor for you through at least the early part of the afternoon tomorrow. In the metro area, nice night. Fair skies and 28 tomorrow. 10 degrees cooler, but still pleasant. Mid 40s. A straight snow shower as that front crosses the front range. And the best chance for snow will be Sunday into Monday. Arctic air moves in Monday as well. Monday's high 20. Tuesday's high only 25. But hey, let's focus on the weekend, which right now is looking pretty good. Kathy, thank you. The most Travis Carr the thing we saw today is a music video highlighting our state's beautiful outdoors. That is 16-year-old Rylan Montoya playing the keyboard. His sister, 19-year-old Maddie, was controlling the camera. They made this striking music video in Deer Creek Canyon with their parents. Look behind them. Not a mountain lion to be seen. Some Denver Broncos are not feeling all too sorry for that sporting goods store in Colorado Springs that we told you is going out of business. The owner said that his business dropped following his stand against the players who had kneeled for the national anthem. Stephen Martin got rid of Nike products, protesting Colin Kaepernick's sponsorship. Martin also canceled an autograph session with the Broncos' Brandon Marshall after Marshall kneeled during the anthem. Marshall tweeted to me that he felt that Martin's protest did not come from a good place, called the closing of the store crazy. Broncos' Shelby Harris had even less mercy. He tweeted to me, karma's a bee. News today, though, involving both Marshall and Kaepernick. Brandon Marshall says he's likely to be released into free agency next month if he stays with the Broncos. Big if. It's going to be for less money. Speaking of money, Colin Kaepernick settled his lawsuit against the NFL today. A confidential payout to set aside that claim that he was blackballed by owners for, for protesting racial injustice during the national anthem. We've told you about the first black officers to serve in the Denver Police Department. She's the next chapter of the story. What's the capital of Colorado? Colorado Springs? Is it? No, oh, Denver. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing we're not running a game show around here. But we do run your good news next. Law enforcement agencies, it said, help to lead America in racial integration in the workplace. And the Denver Police Department likes to say that it helped lead that movement. This city first had African-American officers in the 1870s. During this Black Heritage Month, our Byron Reed introduces us to the department's first African-American division chiefs who helped open doors for others. In the chain of command, you know, we have over 1,500 police officers. Leading by example can set you apart. There are just three division chief uh, positions, so it's a competitive position. It was very difficult. And for 93-year-old Casey Simpson. And I had no idea that it was. Setting himself apart came with some consequences. I was shocked when I faced a lot of issues that I did face. It took a while to get adjusted to for living as a police officer. He signed on to be a patrolman for Denver police in 1956. The blacks did not move anywhere east of High Street. A time when just doing his job was difficult. One time I had a call when I was a patrolman at a house on Capitol Hill. And I, and the owner of the house came up to me and said, uh, who are you? Are you from the post office? 
Simpson eventually worked his way up to division chief in 1983, the first African American to fill that role in the department's history. I don't know if I felt any, I felt any personal uh, accomplishment by me blazing the trail, because it, it had to be blazed eventually. His trail opened the door for other blacks, like Armedia Gordon. She was the first. She was the very first. DPD's first African-American female division chief, appointed in 1992. And when I first came on, uh, there weren't many people who looked like me in this department. She made me feel that I was valued and that everything that I was doing and everything that I was saying was very important. I thought she was very relatable, and I think uh, probably what I admired most is that she had commanded the respect of everybody. Two role models leading the way for other black officers in a department of women and men all connected by the thin blue line. I was just happy to make it and, and uh, open up the whole department where if you study and work hard to get the position, you can get it. For next. I think it's important, rich history that I think is important for us to go forward. I'm Byron Reed. We had hoped to talk with Division Chief Gordon, but she was out of town. DP, DPD says that it currently has 141 black officers, about 10% of the total force. 25 of those officers are women. We are always on the lookout around here for kids who dispel the false stereotypes, the negative stuff about young people these days. How about some love? for the anonymous student at Twin Peaks Charter Academy in Longmont who put a rose and chocolates on every girl's locker in the school. All 88 lockers. Very sweet. Or maybe he's just casting a wide net. I don't know. We return with my favorite part of the week, your good news. And also, what's usually not my favorite part of the program, your feedback. It's been a week, huh? Start and the end of the DPS teacher strike. Broncos go and bring in Joe Flacco to be our next quarterback. There's some story involving a wild animal that I don't really remember. But none of that is what happened in your life. So let's close the week with your good news. My good news is the sun is shining, I got good health, and I get to hang out with good people. Our good news is we're celebrating our anniversary this weekend. That's the great thing about Colorado is you can use a place like this for, for political purposes or just to get out feeling good about yourself and hang out with people that you love. That is absolutely gorgeous. I love the golden roof and the architecture. It's just like, it's beautiful. My good news is this week I, I got an apartment and I'm moving in next week and it's in Toronto so I'm really excited to moving in and finally living on my own. My good news today is actually just being alive another day. Being able to see the sunshine, see that various people walking around taking care of their business in life, and just being here to be a part of that is my good news for the day. My good news is I'm graduating in May with a degree in atmospheric science. There you go. Go. Ready. No, you're going to say you yes. You're going to say My good news is that I get to spread the amazing power of the flow state with people and try to help change the world in a beautiful, healing way. Our good news is that we're able to be here in Colorado to have some fun and to go skiing. Also, if I may add, having the three-day weekend, thanks to all the presidents giving us President's Day. Everybody be blessed and have a great day. You can't look at people who are smiling and frown. It's science. Kate writes in, you tell them, Marshall. Thank you for sticking up for the definition of consent and your passion. Can you believe what was said at the State House today? Ernest writes in, Ernest says, you are a very well-dressed man. My girlfriend thinks so also. You know what she might like for Valentine's Day, Ernest? You in a sharp looking jacket. Enjoy your weekend, brother. See you next time. Subscribe to the next YouTube channel and I'll buy you a beer. Am I actually buying them a beer? This could be a very poor idea. We need some terms and conditions. Offer subject to terms and conditions.